Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll update ASU's partnership with the Mayo Clinic on a new medical school in the Valley, and we'll hear from a supporter of a new national monument near the Grand Canyon. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Contempt of court hearings against Sheriff Joe Arpaio had been postponed. The hearings were set to resume later this month, but the sheriff's attorneys filed a motion to have District Court Judge Murray Snow removed from the case. The reason involves questions Snow asked Arpaio about an investigation that included Snow's wife and a statement she allegedly made suggesting that the judge didn't want Arpaio re-elected. No new dates have been set for the contempt hearings to resume. And a new poll shows that a majority of state residents would like to see marijuana made legal in Arizona. The Behavior Research Center's Rocky Mountain poll found that 53% would support making small amounts of marijuana legal for personal use, while 39% are opposed. There's been some progress in ASU's partnership with the Mayo Clinic for a medical school in the Valley. Here to bring us up to date is ASU President Dr. Michael Crow and Dr. Wyatt Decker, Vice President of the Mayo Clinic and Chief Executive Officer for Mayo in Arizona. Good to see you both again. Thanks for being here. Great to be here, uh, the Before we get too deep here, the relationship between ASU and Mayo Clinic. It's a fantastic relationship where we've taken a comprehensive research university and connected it with the national leading uh, clinic uh, and uh, we found a way to take all the things that we do and all the things that they do and leverage. It's not 2 plus 2 equals 4, it's 2 plus 2 equals 7. So it's research with ASU, uh, the clinical experience with Mayo Clinic, put them both together and... Well, not just research, but it's everything that re ASU does. So social sciences, educational sciences, engineering, computation, uh, bioinformatics, uh, everything that we're working on, even in the humanities and the arts and so forth, then linked with the scientists, physicians, and clinicians, and all the other uh, health specialists that are at the Mayo Clinic. And this has been in the works for quite a while, hasn't it? That's right. So we've been working closely with ASU at the Mayo Clinic for over 12 years, and it's resulted, as Dr. Crow mentions, in a host of collaborations. We have a number of nationally recognized faculty that are co-hired by the two institutions, and we have the fantastic ability to leverage the expertise at ASU for the Mayo Clinic to solve difficult problems in healthcare. I, I, recent developments I, I was reading include licensure by the State Board for uh, a private post-secondary yes. education. What is that all about? So this is Mayo Medical School in Arizona in collaboration with Arizona State University. As you have probably heard, Ted, there is thought to be a national shortage of physicians and Arizona ranks in the bottom quartile in physicians per capita for our population. So one could, one could just stop there and you could say, you know what, we need more doctors in Arizona, let's launch another medical school. However, when you look at all the changes in healthcare that are taking place, we think there's an even more compelling need for a medical school and one here in Arizona. And that's a school that completely redesigns how doctors are educated. And bringing the educational innovations that have been pioneered at ASU has given us a fantastic opportunity to redesign medical education and pilot that right here in Arizona. Talk about that redesign and what, what's, what's being, what will be seen here that hasn't been seen before. So I think there's three core elements. We've built two schools that will run parallel with the medical school and ultimately be a part of the whole medical education ecosystem that uh, Mayo is building. One is in biomedical informatics and one is in the science of health delivery. Uh, those think of it as uh, computation, engineering, economics, uh, decision-making, uh, uh, all of the things that make medicine more effective and uh, more efficient and more successful. And that's not just medicine in the hospital, but your health outside while you're still at home so you're not going to the hospital, all of those things coming together. And then the, the third thing that we've brought to bear here uh, is uh, a new pedagogy for teaching. So think of it as the most advanced technology firms in the world that ASU has integrated into its Ed Plus at ASU unit now plugged into the most significant clinic uh, in the United States in a way in which we can have the most advanced, uh, advanced teaching, learning, and, and uh, uh, projection tools that humans have ever developed now applied to a medical school. And I, I mentioned licensure from the state. I know accreditation yes. was uh, a little, not too long ago That's as correct. well. How difficult was it 
to get the license, to get the accreditation, when, again, you're talking about something new here that maybe some folks haven't seen before. Yes, so our team, again, in collaboration with ASU, uh, was very thorough in our application. And as you know, we run a sister medical school in Rochester, Minnesota. And so by leveraging the expertise both at ASU and at Mayo Medical School in, in in Minnesota, we were able to basically sail through the application process. And there's a, there's a hunger from our nation's leaders in medical education, including the national accrediting body, to start creating generations of physicians that can solve our healthcare problems and not become victims of our healthcare system. Interesting. Are, are yeah. you getting eyes on all this? Are people watching? And we're getting lots of eyes on this because for us, what it, it's a part of a strategy at ASU. Our strategy was to really invest in the in our transdisciplinary way of thinking, linking engineering with science, with social science, with humanities, linking all of that together with economics and business and teaching and bringing all of that together and then to now find a, a medical education, medical research organization that we could work with on a comprehensive basis and Mayo allows us to do this and the medical school is one of the products of the relationship. People are hearing about a medical school, they're hearing Mayo, they're hearing ASU, where is this going to be located? So the home of the school, the home base, will be on our Scottsdale campus. Uh, however, the medical students are, uh, are like gypsies. They'll be all over the valley in all sorts of excellent rotations. They'll be at Tempe. They'll be at the, here at the downtown campus for ASU. They'll be with clinical partners uh, across the valley, including uh, underserved health clinics like Mountain Park. Traditional medical schools, obviously you get your medical degree after a certain amount of time and a certain amount of practice and these sorts of things. Right. But I, I notice that with this uh, collaboration, you can get a master's degree. That's correct. What's that all about? So part of redesigning the curriculum was to free up time in the education of medical students for what we feel are elements that are as important as the traditional diagnosis and treatment of medical conditions. That's still important, but the reality is we also have a lot of technologies that now help with that. So what we've done is we've freed up the curriculum, made it far more efficient, leveraging the educational technology we were talking about, and then we've layered in experiences in systems engineering. And again, this is where the ASU expertise is really valuable. Uh, business community, social sciences, so that the physicians will, all of them in training, will get some sciences of healthcare education, but those who choose to can do a little extra work, not a lot, and get a master's degree. You had mentioned earlier the, the healthcare delivery. I know the science of healthcare delivery, there will be programs involved right. here. Right. Describe those. So we have in downtown Phoenix a new College of Health Solutions that focuses on, you got to think about health uh, outcomes and health solutions as something that we're working toward. I think our objective, including the Mayo Clinic's objective, is to keep you out of the hospital to keep you as healthy right. as long as possible, to use the hospital for major repairs. The science of healthcare delivery, the science of healthcare, the science of health delivery is all about, depending on how you look at it, is all about finding ways to make your health outcomes more successful through your entire life, through data, through education, through analytics, through uh, clinical interactions with trained health professionals via advanced technology. So think of the most advanced technologies, the most advanced learning, the very capable clinicians and clinical support staff all coming together and creating an environment in which you, the individual, uh, is a, is a, a learner uh, and, a, and, and uh, a person benefiting from all of this in a way where your lifetime outcomes will be enhanced. And that's, that's me as an individual, as a patient, as someone who that's may right. not necessarily be a student in the program. For students in the program, I mean, it sounds to me like they can go, you could go off to an inter, all sorts of interdisciplinary actions Absolutely. here. I mean, this is not just going off and wearing a white coat and doing those sorts of things. Exactly. So uh, one element of the curriculum will be interprofessional learning. So we'll put the medical students together in small groups with other pre-professional students, so nursing students, pharmacy students, and give them problems to work out. Uh, could be a patient care challenge. It could be uh, your pharmacy costs are 50% too high and you still need to treat a population of patients. How are you gonna figure this out? So they'll get both the, those, those management skills as well as the patient care skills. Have, uh, please. Well, I just wanna add that, so you know, one of the things that's happened is that so much of our economy now is being devoted to uh, healthcare that it's actually becoming um, negative to the overall economic flexibility and economic competitiveness of the country. We want outstanding healthcare, but we want it at a much lower cost. The way to do that is through 
finding ways to tie in uh, lifelong learning, new ways to produce doctors, new ways for the doctors to work, new ways for the doctors to solve, and the nurses and the support staff to solve other kinds of problems. You can't do that by just approaching things in the same old way. You need whole new methodological approaches, and that's what this partnership between Mayo and ASU is all about. And it sounds like uh, a lot of students that may not be in the program, again, can get can touch and go in some of these classes and some of these instruction and learn for themselves. Absolutely. That's right. Okay. When is this going to be up, operational, and ready to go? What do we got here? So with all the accreditation in place, uh, all the work is ongoing, and on July of 2017, the first stu students will start. So it seems like a ways, but a year and a half from now, we're going to have uh, students showing up. And between now and then, and even from then on forward, challenges. What do you see as the biggest challenge? You know, the real, the real challenge here is can we move fast enough to uh, get more... Uh, uh, positive health solutions out to a population that's suffering from a range of maladies from obesity to a range of other modern maladies. How do we find a way where we can enhance yeah. the quality of life at the lowest possible cost doing that with a new kind of physician that will be produced? And for this question for both of you from different uh, vantage points here. Uh, from academics, are you hearing some naysayers? Are you hearing people saying, oh, this can't be done? This you is know, there's always naysayers in anything. Uh, they're usually not informed or they're just uh, curmudgeons. I mean, they just, they just view the world in a completely negative way. They're basically against everything. Uh, the uh, uh, Mayo, Mayo and ASU received a significant uh, grant to advance this. There's been uh, lots of seed funding coming in from different sources, many donors that are involved in helping to make this work. And so this is a, a, a privately financed uh, effort that's advancing at really rapid speed from a lot of people that are supportive of what we're trying to do. And the hospital world, are some uh, folks out there raising their eyebrows a little bit here? Uh, as Michael said, there's always skeptics. Uh, however, we are part through uh, an AMA grant with ASU. We're part of a consortium of 11 medical schools that all want to change and learn from each other. And I have to say that we should all take a lot of pride in Arizona because we're really leading the pack in innovation and in how our nation's doctors are trained. Well, certainly sounds like it. July of 2017? That's right. All right. We'll, we'll see you a couple of times before then, <laughs> yes, I hope. I Good hope to so. have you both here. Great Thank to you. be here. Thank you. Monday, we heard from an Arizona Game and Fish Commissioner who is against the creation of a new national monument at the Grand Canyon watershed area. Here to speak in support of the monument is Sandy Barr, director of the Sierra Club's Grand Canyon chapter. Good to see you again. Nice to be here. Thanks for being here. But before we get started again, for those who may have missed the other conversation or still aren't quite sure, what is the Grand Canyon watershed? Well, the, this is an area uh, surrounding Grand Canyon National Park. There are national forest lands and Bureau of Land Management lands, uh, places like House Rock Valley, uh, the North Kaibab, uh, the South Kaibab, the Tucson area. Uh, and there's a proposal to protect the area as a national monument, the Grand Canyon Watershed National Monument. Why is a monument needed there? A monument's needed for a number of reasons. Uh, one being we would like to see that area permanently protected from uranium mining. Uh, there is currently uh, an, uh, about a million acres that is protected for 20 years, really only 17 now because we're three years into the withdrawal. Uh, but, um, but that time goes very quickly and, uh, and uh, a new president, um, uh, the 
withdrawal could expire and those lands would not be protected from uranium mining. So, so that's a key issue for sure. Uh, I know that critics of the monument idea say that uh, it will necessitate, I think, a degradation of habitat. And they point to uh, the, the Sonoran Monument, reduction of bighorn sheep there after that was made a monument, a significant reduction of bighorn sheep there, and other. Forest thinning would be more difficult to do, access for forest thinning would be more difficult to do, wildfires thus more of a problem. How do you respond to that? Well, that's nonsense. Uh, national monuments have uh, protected lands and improved habitat uh, throughout history. I mean, Grand Canyon, National Park was once a monument. Now that, uh, that's not the kind of monument that we're talking about. This monument would be managed by the Forest Service and by the Bureau of Land Management. Um, there uh, is a, an important wildlife corridor on the northern part for mule deer primarily uh, that will be protected by this monument. And um, there are, there's no indication that monument designation has resulted in the decline of wildlife species. The bighorn sheep issue, that's a red herring. The bighorn sheep population was decreasing before it was a monument, and uh, the agency's own information talks about disease and drought, which is, you know, usually the case. But the idea that, that uh, the game and fish would not be able to get in there as easily or get in there and access certain uh, abilities to manage wildlife, uh, to manage the area in general, uh, viable? Viable well, argument, you think? First of all, the number one thing affecting wildlife is loss of habitat and habitat fragmentation. So the fact that the Game and Fish Commission is not recognizing that and is opposing, they have a blanket opposition to any special designation. So it's not like they even looked at the particulars of this. They're just saying no to everything. So, so that's uh, the first issue. The other is they can indeed get into do wildlife management and have, and the monument proclamations say that the state retains its authority to manage wildlife. But they say that it would be limited access. What they can do now, they may not be able to do then. Well, you know, nobody can do anything they want, any place. You know, there is accountability, and whether they realize it or not, they're a public agency. They're accountable to the public, and these are public lands. So even now, as national forests and uh, Bureau of Land Management lands, they, are, they can't just go in and say, oh, we're going to build something here or we're going to drive across this cultural site or bulldoze this area. There, there has to be a review and accountability. Another argument is that uh, a monument, making this area a monument, will destroy the local economies lack of access, reduced visitors, these sorts of things, and all of a sudden the local economy goes belly up. Again, how do you respond? Well, history is our teacher. All the research indicates that monuments help the local economies. And protecting these areas helps to uh, promote tourism. Uh, Northern Arizona is very reliant on tourism and uh, protecting these areas and, and pr providing the kinds of protections that also help to uh, protect the wildlife corridors with Grand Canyon and the connectivity, that's, that's good for the economy. So, so when, when they say that you're limiting access for hunting, for fishing, for recreation, thus uh, reduced numbers of people will show up and thus reduced spending will occur, you say? Nonsense. Again, the, the, uh, the mule deer corridor will be protected. That's good for mule deer. That's good for hunting good for wildlife viewing. It, it just hasn't borne out. Um, there, there's a lot of scare tactics out there, a lot of uh, language to try to make people think they won't have access, but that just hasn't happened with the other monuments. The uh, Antiquities Act, which if this all involves as far as making monuments, um, again, is supposed to, according to the critics now, call for the smallest possible area to be included to uh, uh, protect and at least recognize one specific cultural asset. This is like 1.7 million acres here and there's a number of stuff up there, there quite a few assets. They're saying too much, too broad. Well, if you look at what's being protected, first of all, I encourage them to get out on the ground and see what's there because it's a pretty special area, whether it's north of the canyon and House Rock Valley or on the, on the North Kaibab. Uh, we still have remaining old growth ponderosa pines up on the North Kaibab. Those are important things to protect. 
And the, uh, the other thing is, if you also look at a map, you will see how many uh, mining claims are on these lands. Now, they're not uh, valid claims, but they're claims. And if the mineral withdrawal goes away, uh, the mining companies could go forward with those. We've already seen significant damage from uranium mining, which is why hundreds of thousands of people across the country supported the proposal to protect that area from mining and why there is broad support for making this a national monument. People, people care about protecting this area. Um, there are a few nay naysayers, including, unfortunately, our Game and Fish Commission, which does not seem to be in step. I mean, they supported the Oak Flat land swap. How was that good for wildlife? Well, and I think, I think the bottom line is that they, a lot of folks, game and fish included, I'm sure, think that the process, there was not due process here. There wasn't enough in the way of public hearings. There wasn't enough in the way of asking Arizonans what they want and get everyone and their brother up there exp saying it's good, it's bad, it's somewhere in between. It hasn't been established yet. There is, this is the opportunity to express, saying we oppose everything, that's not a, a way to, you know, get your foot in the door to have a discussion. And that's what game and fish did. There's no proclamation yet. Nothing has been decided. There have been public meetings. There will be more. And uh, there's every opportunity to participate in that. Plus, there will have to be a management plan. And that will go through the National Environmental Policy Act process, which provides great opportunity for public involvement, which is why we support that law so much. Well, we had Game and Fish on Monday. We got you on tonight. Get both sides of the story. Good to have you here. Thanks for great joining us. Great to be here. Thanks. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.